I read that you fell in love with the idea of space and space exploration when you were five, mm. uh, watching Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. So let me uh, ask you to look back at the historical context and impact of that. So the space race from 1957 to 1969 between the Soviet Union and the US was in many ways epic. It was um, a rapid sequence of dramatic events. First satellite to space, first human to space, for a spacewalk, first uncrewed landing on the moon, then some failures, explosions, deaths on both sides actually, and then the first human walking on the moon. Uh, what are some of the more inspiring moments or insights you take away from that time, those few years, that just uh, 12 years? Well, I mean, there's so much inspiring there. Um, you know, one of the great things to take away from that, one of the great Von Braun quotes is, I have, uh, I have come to use the word impossible with great caution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, that's kind of the big story of Apollo, is that things, you know, the, uh, going to the moon was literally an analogy that people used for something that's impossible. You know, oh yeah, you'll do that when, when you know, men walk on the moon. Yeah. And of course it finally happened. Um, so, you know, I think it was, pulled forward in time because of the space race i think you know with the geopolitical implications and you know how much resource was put into it you know at the peak that program was spending you know two or three percent of gdp uh on the apollo program so much resource that i think it was pulled forward in time you know we kind of did it ahead of when we quote unquote should have done it yeah um and so in that way it's also a technical marvel I mean, it's truly incredible. It's, uh, you know, it's the 20th century version of building the pyramids or something. It's, you know, it's an achievement that um, because it was pulled forward in time, because it did something that had previously been thought impossible, it rightly deserves its place as, you know, in the pantheon of great human achievements. And of course, you named uh, the projects, the rockets, that Blue Origin is working on after some of the folks involved. Yeah. I don't understand why I didn't say New Gagarin. I, is that- There's that... an American bias oh, in the naming. Okay. I apologize. This is very uh, strange. <laughs> Lex. <laughs> Just asking for a friend. Clarify. I'm a big fan of Gagarin's though. And in fact, I um, I think his, his first words in space um, I think are incredible. He, you know, he purportedly said, my God, it's blue. And that really drives home. No one had seen the Earth from space. No one knew that we were on this blue planet. Yeah. No one knew what it looked like from out there. And Gagarin was the first person to see it. One of the things I think about is how dangerous those early days were for Gagarin, for, for Glenn, for everybody involved, like how, how big of a risk they were all taking. They were taking huge risks. I'm not sure what the uh, Soviets thought about Gagarin's flight, but... I think that the Americans thought that the Alan Shepard flight, the flight that you know New Shepard is named after, the first American in space, he went on his suborbital flight. They thought he had about a seventy-five percent chance of success. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that's a pretty big risk, a twenty-five percent risk. It's it's kind of interesting that Alan Shepard is not quite as famous as John Glenn. So for people who don't know, Alan Shepard is the first uh, astronaut. The first American in space. American in suborbital flight. Correct. And and then the first orbital flight is... And then John, John Glenn is the first American to orbit the Earth. By the way, I have the most charming, sweet, incredible letter from John Glenn, which I have framed and hang on my office wall. What did he say? Where he tells me how uh, grateful he is that we have named New Glenn after him. And he sent me that letter about a week before he died. Um, and it's really an incredible. It's also a very funny letter. He's he's writing and he says, you know, this is a, a letter about New Glenn from the original Glenn, and he's just he's got a great <laughs> sense of humor and he's yeah. very he's very um, happy about it and grateful. It's very sweet. Does he say P.S. Don't mess this up, or is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. Make me look good. He doesn't do that. <laughs> okay, but, but wait, right. but John, wherever you are, we got you covered. All right. Good. Uh, so. So back to maybe the big picture of space. When you look up at the stars uh, and think big, what do you hope is the future of humanity hundreds, thousands of years from now out in space? I would love to see you know a, a you know a trillion humans living in the solar system. 
if we had a trillion humans, we would have at any given time a thousand Mozarts and a thousand Einsteins. Um, that would, you know, our solar system would be full of life and intelligence and energy. Um, and we can easily support a civilization that large with all of the resources um, in the solar system. So, what do you think that looks like? Giant space stations? Yeah, the only way to get to that vision is with giant space stations. You know, the planetary surfaces are just way too small. Um, so you can, I mean, unless you turn them into giant space stations or something, but, but yeah, we will take materials from the moon and from near earth objects and from the asteroid belt and so on. And we'll build a uh, giant O'Neill style colonies, um, and people will live in those. And they have a lot of advantages over planetary surfaces. You can spin them to get normal earth gravity, you can put them where you want them. I think most people are going to want to live uh, near Earth, not necessarily in Earth orbit, but in you know uh, Earth, but near Earth vicinity uh, orbits, uh, and so that they can move quick, you know relatively quickly uh, back and forth between their station and Earth. So, but I, don't th I think a lot of people, especially in the early stages, are not going to want to give up Earth altogether. They, they go to Earth for vacation. Yeah. Same way that you know you might go to to Yellowstone National Park for vacation. People will uh, and the event and no one and people will get to choose whether they live on Earth or whether they live in space, but they'll be able to use much more energy and much more material resource in space than they would be able to use on Earth. One of the interesting ideas you had is uh, to move the heavy industry away from Earth. So people sometimes have this idea that somehow space exploration is in conflict with the celebration of the planet Earth, that we should focus on preserving Earth. And, and basically your idea is that space travel and space exploration is a way to preserve Earth. Exactly. This planet, we've sent robotic probes to all the planets. We know that this is the good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not to play favorites it's or anything. But. but Earth really is the good planet. It's yeah. an amazing it's it's amazing. The ecosystem we have here, all of the life and the lush uh the plant life and you know the water resources, everything. This planet is really extraordinary. And of course, we evolved on this planet, so of course it's perfect for us. But it's also perfect for all the advanced life forms on this planet, all the animals and so on. And so this is a gem. We do need to take care of it. And as we enter the Anthropocene, as we get, as we humans have gotten so uh, sophisticated and large and impactful, as we stride across this planet, you know, it's the, that is going to, as, as we continue, we want to use a lot of energy. We want to use a lot of energy per capita. We've gotten amazing things. We, we don't want to go backwards. You know, if you think about, um, the good old days, they're mostly an illusion. Like in almost every way, life is better for almost everyone today than it was, say, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. We, all, we live better lives, by and large, than our grandparents did and than their grandparents did and so on. And you can see that in global illiteracy rates, global poverty rates, global infant mortality rates. Like almost any metric you choose, we're better off than we used to be and we get you know, antibiotics and all kinds of life-saving medical care and so on and so on. And there's one thing that is moving backwards, and it's the natural world. Mm -hmm. So it is a fact that 500 years ago, pre-industrial age, the natural world was pristine. Um, it was incredible. And we have traded some of that pristine beauty for all of these other gifts that we have as an advanced society. And we can have both, but to do that, we have to go to space. And all of this really, the most fundamental measure is energy usage per capita. And when you look at, you know, you do want to continue to use more and more energy. It is going to make your life better in so many ways, but that's not compatible ultimately with living on a finite planet. And so we have to go out into the solar system. Uh, and, and really you could argue about when you have to do that, but you can't credibly argue about whether you have to do that. Eventually, we have to do that. Exactly. So you don't often talk about it, but let me ask you on that topic about the blue ring and the orbital reef uh, space infrastructure projects. 
What's your vision for these? So Blue Ring is a very interesting spacecraft that is uh, designed to take up to 3,000 kilograms of payload up to uh, geosynchronous orbit or in lunar vicinity. Uh, it has two different kinds of propulsion. It has chemical propulsion and it has electric propulsion. And so it can you can be you can use blue ring in a couple of different ways. You can slowly move, let's say, up to geosynchronous orbit using electric propulsion. That might take you know 100 days or 150 days, depending on how much mass you're carrying. Uh, and then and reserve your chemical propulsion so that you can change orbits quickly in geosynchronous orbit. Or you can use the chemical propulsion first to quickly get up to geosynchronous, and then use your electrical propulsion to slowly change your geosynchronous orbit. Blue Ring has uh, a couple of interesting features. It's a uh, it, it provides a lot of services to these payloads. So the payload it can be one large payload, or it can be a number of small payloads. And it provides thermal management. It provides electric power. It provides uh, compute. Um, provides communications. And so when you design a payload for Blue Ring, you don't have it's it, it, you don't have to figure out all of those things on your own. So kind of radiation tolerant compute is a complicated thing to do. And so we have a, an unusually large amount of radiation tolerant compute on board Blue Ring and you can your payload can just use that when it needs to. So it's a uh, uh, it's sort of all these services. It's you know, it's it's like a set of APIs. It's a little bit like Amazon Web Services, but for, for, space. for space payloads that need to move about in Earth vicinity or lunar vicinity. Uh, AWSS. <laughs> okay, so uh, so compute in space. So you get you get a giant chemical rocket to get a payload out to orbit, and then you have these uh, admins that show up. This blue ring. A uh, thing that manages various things like compute. Exactly, and it can it can also provide transportation and move you around to different orbits, including humans. You you think? No, or? but Blue Ring is not designed to move humans around. Um, it's designed to move payloads around. Okay. So we're also building a lunar lander, uh, which is of course designed to to land humans on the surface of the moon. <laughs> 